Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's December 23rd. Today, we celebrate a gardener who was also a founding father and a governor of New York. We'll also learn about a botanist who brought back the bird of paradise, Strelitzia regini as well as a plant that is now the oldest living potted plant at Kew. We'll hear a charming poem that takes us through the seasons by an English poet who was friends with many other poets, including Mary Wollstonecraft. And we grow that garden library today with a good old garden book that teaches how to grow your own food. And then we'll wrap things up with another delightful story about the mistletoe. And this one is a heart warmer. But first, I just wanted to take a second to tell you about the Daily Gardener Friday newsletter. Each and every Friday, even when the show is on break, subscribers to the newsletter get an exclusive email from me with some super useful content, including helpful reminders and tips for the week to help you grow as a gardener. I also include a handy list for you that features all of the books from the Grow That Garden Library that were mentioned on the show the past week. So that's all right there for you. And then I provide a brand new botanist profile along with two pieces of botanical poetry that have not been shared on the show. And you'll also get plenty of garden-inspired recipes, gifts, and hacks. I love all of that. And finally, I like to make the newsletter a little more personal. So you'll see photos and stories about my own home and garden, in addition to exclusive updates about the show. I think of it as a little behind-the-scenes VIP experience for super fans of the podcast. And don't forget that each week, one lucky subscriber will be chosen as a winner for a lovely gardening book from the Grow That Garden Library bookshelf. And I like to say, if you enjoy the podcast, you're going to love the newsletter. So head on over to the dailygardener.org and sign up for the free Friday newsletter today. Here's today's curated garden news. Today's post is from Fine Gardening, one of my favorite magazines, and this one was written by Greg Lodes, and it's called Six Great Plants for a New Perennial Design, and these are new perennial stars, and Greg reviews them for us. And I'll kick it off by sharing with you what Greg says about new perennial style. He writes, The new perennial style emphasizes the year-round shape and structure of the planting rather than an abundance of flowers in summer. Roses and showy summer flowers are not to be found. Simple, single flowers are planted instead of frilly doubles. And rather than having a summer peak like you do with a cottage garden, a new perennial garden with its sturdy grasses and mostly late summer flowering perennials is left untouched throughout the fall and winter. Greg goes on to share a little bit more about this perennial style, and then he lists his six favorite perennials. And they range from Mexican feather grass to a special species of New England aster, moor grass, and a beautiful sneezeweed. Now, if you'd like to read about all six of Greg's six plants for a new perennial design, All you need to do is head on over to the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Daily Gardener Community, because that's where I share all of my curated news articles and original blog posts. And if you're looking for today's article, just look for the word perennial and Greg's post will pop up. That way you don't have to worry about taking notes or search for links. It's very easy. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the American founding father and gardener, John Jay. 
who was born on this day, December 23rd in 1745. When he wasn't serving as the second governor of New York and the first chief justice of the United States, John Jay loved to garden. John's ancestral home was in Rye, New York, and today the Jay Heritage Center oversees the Jay Estate and its incredible landscape, which includes stone ha-ha walls from 1822, one and a half acres of historic sunken gardens from the 1700s, a meadow, an apple orchard, and an elm tree alley. And here's a little interesting fact about John Jay. His great-granddaughter, Mary Rutherford Jay, grew up on the ancestral Jay estate, and she became one of America's earliest landscape architects and an advocate of horticultural education and women's careers. In 1801, John and his wife, Sarah, retired to their farmhouse in Bedford, Westchester County, Yet their dream of settled farm life was cut short when Sarah died at the age of 45. John never remarried, and he lived out his remaining 30 years on this earth as a gentleman farmer. Today, the John Jay Homestead features four gardens that reflect the John Jay family. The formal gardens feature a fountain and a sundial. The terrace garden features deer-resistant plants and an apple orchard in a nod to John Jay's original orchard. And there's another garden that was originally a cutting garden for the Jay family, and it's now been turned into an herb garden that was redesigned by Paige Dickey, who laid out a 17th century English knot garden. There's a teaching garden to inspire kids to get involved in horticulture. And I think that the most touching garden of all is the blue and white North Courtyard Garden, which was inspired by a book of pressed flowers from John's daughter, Maria J. This charming blue and white garden features violets, poppies, and irises, which bloom from spring to fall. And I should mention that all of the gardens at the John Jay Homestead are tended by local garden clubs. And today is the anniversary of the death of the Scottish gardener, botanical illustrator, and very first plant hunter for Q, Francis Mason, who died on this day, December 23rd in 1805. After proving himself capable at Q, Joseph Banks sent Francis on an expedition to Southern Africa, where he met up with the Swedish botanist Carl Peter Thunberg. Together, Francis and Carl ventured into the Veldt and the Blue Mountains. Surviving the extreme heat, lack of water, and dangerous wild animals, Francis made it back to England in 1775. With his gardener's eye for ornamentals, Francis had brought back many plants and seeds to England, and in a letter to Linnaeus, Francis reported he had added upwards of 400 new species to His Majesty's collection of living plants. Among Francis's specimens were gladiolus, irises, nifofias, lobelias, and pelargoniums, as well as the stunning bird of paradise flower, which was named to honor the wife of George III, Queen Charlotte, who was a patroness of the arts, an amateur botanist in her own right, and a champion of Kew Gardens. And the name of the plant had to do with the fact that the queen was born in Germany in a county known as mecklenburg strelitz And so the botanical name for the bird of paradise is the Strelitzia regini. As for Francis, after his trip to South America, he went on expeditions to North America, Portugal, and Northern Africa. But in 1785, he returned to his favorite destination, South Africa. This time, Francis spent a decade there, 
botanizing deep into the country's interior. And it was during this time that Francis discovered the arum lily and the calla lily. And when he wasn't plant hunting, Francis was busy cultivating his magnificent personal garden in Cape Town. Today, gardeners marvel at Francis's drawings of South Africa's Cape Floral Kingdom. In the twilight of his life, Francis experienced a dreadful voyage to North America. Between two run-ins with pirates and terrible weather, Francis's ship barely made it to New York. And after discovering the Trillium grandiflorum on his way to Canada, Francis died on this day in 1805. It was Francis Mason who pioneered plant exploration and transformed European gardens through his discoveries of over 1,700 species. Today at Kew Gardens, you can see the oldest potted plant in the world. It's an Eastern Cape giant cycad with the botanical name Encephalertos altensteinii, and it basically looks like a large potted palm cycad. It was brought to England in 1775 after Francis Mason's first trip to South Africa. little nice memento there. In Unearthed Words, here's a poem from the English poet and school teacher Anne Batten Crystal. And in the poem, you'll hear Anne describe chasing a little fairy through the seasons. Through springtime walks with flowers perfumed, I chased a wild, capricious fair, where hyacinths and jonquils bloomed chanting gay sonnets through the air. Hid amid a briary dell or neath a hawthorn tree, her sweet enchantments led me on and still deluded me. While summer's splendid glory smiles, my ardent love in vain essayed. I strove to win her heart by wiles, but still a thousand pranks she played. Still over each sunburned furzy hill, wild, playful, gay, and free. She laughed and scorned. I chased her still, and still she bantered me. When autumn waves her golden ears and wafts over fruits her pregnant breath, the sprightly lark its pinion rears, I chased her over the daisied heath and all around was glee. Still, wanton as the timid heart, she swiftly flew from me. Now winter lights its cheerful fire, while jests with frolic mirth resound, and draws the wandering beauty nigher. Tis now too cold to rove around. The Christmas game, the playful dance, incline her heart to glee. Mutual we glow, and kindling love draws every wish to me. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Grow Your Own Food Handbook by Monty Birch. This book came out in 2014, and the subtitle is A Back to the Basics Guide to Planting, Growing, and Harvesting Fruits and Vegetables. In this book, Monty puts together a simple resource for gardeners who are eager to reap the benefits of homegrown vegetables and fruits. Monty shares detailed instructions for fall and winter food growing and the specific health benefits for each crop. Learn how to grow, how to harvest, and how to store your own food. This book is 240 pages of guided instruction from Monty Birch, showing you how to grow all types of fruits, vegetables, and even grains. You can get a copy of the Grow Your Own Food Handbook by Monty Birch and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $5. It's a great deal. Finally, here's something sweet 
to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, December 23rd in 1978, that the Oshkosh Northwestern out of Oshkosh, Wisconsin, published a story called Mystical Mistletoe is Historical Sprig by Pat Vander Velden. Here's an excerpt. Pliny the Elder, a first century Roman naturalist, was one of the first freelance writers to recognize mistletoe as a lucrative story idea. He chronicled the esteem that the Druids held for the mystical evergreen that grows on oak, elm, apple, hawthorn, and poplar trees. Now, according to Pliny, the Druids' name for the plant was Oliak, meaning all heal, and the Druids thought mistletoe could cure everything from sterility to the common cold. As late as the 17th century, Nicholas Culpepper said, Mistletoe is good for the grief of itch, sores, toothaches, and the biting of mad dogs and venomous beasts. Nathaniel Hawthorne was not that impressed. In 1855, he wrote about mistletoe and called it, quote, an uninteresting plant with white, wax-looking berries, dull green on a parasitical stem. Hawthorne was puzzled by the raging fad of the day. He wrote, The maids of the house did their utmost to entrap the gentlemen, old and young, and there to kiss them, after which they were expected to pay a shilling. Obviously, Hawthorne was frugal and didn't approve of paying for his affection. Probably the most famous of writers to refer to mistletoe is Charles Dickens. In the Pickwick Papers, Mr. Pickwick kisses Lady Tollemglore under the mistletoe. Quote, Mr. Pickwick, with a gallantry that would have done honor to a descendant of Lady Tollemglore, led her beneath the mystic branch and saluted her in all courtesy and decorum. And so it turns out that the custom of kissing under the mistletoe is lost somewhere between the Druids and Dickens. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, Kiana Raley, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram, and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.